Uh, my name is Ariel, and I'm going to talk to you about my journey from going from JavaScript to Go. Um, so basically, we're going to dive into some different topics. Like first, I'm going to talk about a little background about myself, and then we're going to jump it, jump into like what has made me interested in Go and why I've even chosen to look into it. Um, then we're going to jump into a few differences between languages. And then uh, I'm gonna showcase some Go gotchas that basically got me really, uh, I basically had to like sink in and spend some time uh, with it whenever I was start learning Go at first. Um, and little disclaimer, <laughs> I know this is a Go meetup, but I might actually show some JavaScript code on the screen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been a software dev for about six, seven years now. Um, my first language that I've learned was PHP, actually. Um, <laughs> my, my university course at the time was mostly learning, teaching to build web applications. And at the time, they were teaching PHP and JavaScript. Um, so JavaScript has been part of my programming career, as I can remember. Um, I've developed backend services and front end applications using it. Um, I've seen the sort of like hype of jQuery, the madness of callback health, and the evolution of ES6, and the sort of rise of popular frameworks like React and Vue, um, where you build web apps and sort of reusable UI components. Um, and that's sort of where I was heavily focused on uh, at the end of my JavaScript journey. So I was like, I was a front end dev and I felt pretty confident and productive using JavaScript. So you might wonder why have I started looking into Go? Um, so at the time when I started getting interested in Go, as I say, I was a front end dev um, and our application was sort of written in Vue and our backend service was uh, written in Go. Um, and uh, basically there was a time when some of our front end developers managed to add some simple functionality to Go um, without previous experience. So I started sort of like poking around our backend code base um, to see if I can sort of like follow the code and see what it's doing. Um, and frankly enough, you know, I could follow some simple endpoints um, and understand some basic flow and logic. Obviously, I didn't understand everything, um, but I really liked the structure of the code and um, it got me basically curious and wanted to move and learn more. <clears throat> so I decided to like start Udemy course uh, to learn Go and every free evening I had, um, I would do a little bit. Um, it was sort of like waiting on a date during the day. I got you know excited uh, <laughs> to get into the evening to learn more Go. Um, and then the more I completed it, the, the more I liked it and how simple it was to pick up and be sort of productive. And uh, the ad idioms, uh, like the what the language was about, and you know what, like only twenty five keywords. JavaScript, I think, might have 50 plus, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, these two guys, uh, Todd and Bill, have made learning Go for me really fun. Um, and the more I watched these guys, the, the, the more I wanted to learn. Um, they explained stuff really clearly. Um, and it was sort of like watching a Netflix show, you know, it's 2 a.m., um, you've got work next day. Uh, but but then you need to watch the, another episode. Uh, um, uh, um, and I assume everybody has seen sort of similar picture um, like front end versus back end. Um, and like, honestly, in my opinion, um, be the front end or back end, they, they all have their own challenges and people should really do what they're passionate about and what they enjoy most. Um, but anyway, uh, getting back, uh, so the time went on and I was getting more comfortable writing Go um, in my own time. Um, 
and I had some previous experience with the back end and I sort of started missing uh, working as a back end dev. Um, and I was finding myself uh, being slowly pulled into the dark side, mm -hmm. as you may call it. <laughs> so, um, and I was really fortunate that uh, the time has fought in the backend team uh, has opened up uh, to which I have applied. Um, and luckily enough, I got the job and I've been programming with Go since and I've been loving. Um, but yep, yeah, enough about me. Uh, let's jump into some fun stuff and dive into some differences. Um, so first, uh, JavaScript is dynamic and weak typed language. So what this means is basically, if you take a look at this example, you can basically set a variable as a end, and then change it to a string, and then change it to Boolean again. Um, and then we consider another example of uh, creating a constant with an end, and then trying to concatenate that with a string, then, you know, uh, all this stuff is possible in JavaScript. So imagine how simple it is to make a simple mistake or you end up doing a lot of boilerplate checks to see, you know, what you're receiving is actually what you expect. Um, and because uh, JavaScript is also dynamic, you also run into or find these bugs uh, at the runtime. Um, there are, however, like frameworks like TypeScript um, that add that, that, you know, type safety to JavaScript. Um, on the other hand, with Go, we have, it's basically statically type language. Um, so we get that type safety and error and some simple error checks uh, at the compile time, which is, which is great, right? Um, uh, sp for spotting simple bugs or whatever, like uh, we've got go fmt tool uh, which formats the code with some sort of like convention um, which i think is really amazing um you can imagine how many times we had a conversations in our team to discuss like our ESLIN styling roles and stuff um, and sometimes uh, the conversations can be very opinionated and heated <laughs> sometimes um but uh, I really, really like that uh, Go actually uh, has some standard code styling uh, convention set for you already in Go. Um, so, um, but of course, if you need another layer on top, um, you can add some stuff with static check or Golang CLI rules as well. Um, and uh, another thing about JavaScript is that it's known for it's not blocking behavior. Uh, which means basically it doesn't wait for a response of an API uh, call, but moves on to the, another block of code below it. Um, and there are tools within the language to help you use and achieve the blocking behavior like async and await. Um, but as you may notice, it's sort of quite different to how Go, Go works. And you would have to have a good mental model of what you're trying to do uh, and what you're trying to call and so um, so imagine a simple example where you, for example, um, make a call uh, to make an MPI call and then rely on the return da data to make another API call. Um, so with async await, like the code is pretty nice these days, but uh, previously you would use promises and uh, a lot of chaining or callbacks to, to achieve that. Uh, and uh, in terms of like ecosystem, uh, Go definitely doesn't have that many packages and frameworks that JavaScript has. And I think NPM is one of the largest package registries in the world. Um, there's probably a package for whatever you can think of. Um, but what I have found interesting early on in Go is actually it encourages you, encourage you you to write your own implementations um, and we have a great st standard library um, and with like go tooling we don't really need to install additional libraries to run tests or do benchmarks um, it's all, all part, part of go um, 
and with every upgrade you go gets better <laughs> so on our last meetup mark, mark took us through the cost of those coming in 1.20 uh, uh, but there are however few things that i definitely missed whenever i first moved uh, between uh whenever i was first learning it and for example manipulating slices arrays as they as it's called in uh javascript don't get confused uh it's basically if i say javascript arrays it's sort of like when we use slices and go for um but uh <clears throat> Basically, JavaScript is a lot more built-in functionality for manipulating um, arrays, uh, slices. Um, for example, like joining things together, adding, adding uh, items to front or to as the last item, or adding two items to the beginning, etc. Um, there's just more built-in stuff uh, within the language to handle that. Um, so if we take a look at this example, we have array and if we want to join them, we just call this join function and pass in the limiter, and off you go. Um, whereas uh, in Go, it's a bit more effort to do it. Um, so if we take a look at this example, what I've got here is a join in function um, that basically arranges through the uh, slice and then appends the uh the the, the stuff uh, to and converts the converts it to a string and then uses the string stop join to 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 join them together with a separator that you pass in uh, as well um and the funny thing is that all of us here could write a different implementation for 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 this stuff um could be a fun exercise or maybe as a workshop to for us all to do but uh, what i'm trying to say here i bet you you have ended up writing a bunch of uh, functions like that at some point to help you manipulate sizes um another one is a uh, ternary operator um i'm a huge sort of like follower of not using else statements um of course sometimes it's necessary uh but uh, i was trying to think of a way to avoid writing else <clears throat> and uh ternary operator was really handy uh for that if you had write really simple conditional stuff you wanted to to uh, validate uh, to get like true false values or something like that um it was very you know simple to do uh, so th this is sort of like the same sort of thing we've got in go uh, but uh, of course with great power comes great responsibility i've seen some nasty ternary operators uh, which have been chains and impossible to read and follow uh, but using it at that one level you know it's uh, it was very ha handy at times uh, and handling errors is much different uh, as, as well like in, in go what we probably are all used to is writing error not equals no checks and probably all of us can write that with our eyes closed sure. uh, but uh, it is the idiomatic way of writing errors and basically return them you know wrap them and bubble it up um, but i was mostly used to like try catch and exceptions being thrown which is a bit different um and yeah so now we're gonna jump into a few Gotchas that basically had to sink in with me whenever I was first learning Go. Um, so the first one is pointers. Oh, yeah, the amount of time I've seen this error. Uh, <laughs> uh, but prior to Go, I didn't really have any experience using pointers and the sort of like concept of holding memory's value, accessing it, and passing it around was really like foreign to me. Um, so I spent a good bit of time practicing it. Um, but let's take a look at closer example. Um, so what we got here is basically a struct called meetup. We've got a welcome method attached to it. 
And in the main go, we try to initialize it on line 16. And then uh, we try to call the welcome method. Um, what, what do you think will happen whenever we run that? Uh, it's going to run into that of the error we seen on the previous slide. Um, and uh, basically, the initialized pointer P we see on 9.16 uh, is nil, and you can't follow a nil pointer. Uh, so based on the go-like specification quote, uh, <laughs> if x is nil, an attempt to evaluate pointer x will cause a runtime panic. Uh, so how could we fix this previous example, right? Well, there are a few ways to, to sort of go about it. <clears throat> One, we could initialize the P without the pointer reference, like on 916 that is commented out here, and use the zero values. Um, and then, or secondly, we could initialize the meetup struct and actually specify the name. Or third one, which is another example from like 20 to 23, is basically uh, probably a more production level example, is where we simply forgot to null check um, before calling welcome. Um, so that's the sort of things that how you can fix the, the, the previous issue. Um, Another thing about pointers um, is that structs and arrays are copied when used in assignments and passed as arguments to functions. But with pointers, this can be avoided. Um, so if we take a look at this example, what we've got here is we have a struct car with a field name. And then we have uh, two functions, Lamborghini and Ferrari. Uh, and if you take a closer look, uh, Ferrari takes a pointer reference to a car and Lamborghini doesn't. Um, <clears throat> so when we try to call Lamborghini from main um, on line 24, you can see that whenever we change the name value in the function, it doesn't get reflected. And the change basically doesn't get reflected back in the main of go. But we do the same uh, thing and part called the Ferrari function. You can then see the 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 change being affected in main dot go. Um, and it's whenever I fir was first learning it, it was like wow. So uh, because you need to be really careful how you pass in structs and arrays uh, into functions, because you can have some really nasty side effects if you're not careful. Um, um, another one is range and go routines. Um, so at first, um, you might think that there's nothing wrong with this code, uh, right? But whenever we run it, we actually get the output of a bunch of numbers fours. Uh, so what, what what is going on, right? Um, basically, whenever we call the uh, whenever the, the, the we initialize the number uh, on line eleven in the range, uh, it actually takes the value of each slice element and points to the same address. Um, but actually, the go routine might, might not uh, fire processing until the loop is done. Uh, so that sort of explains why we're seeing this unexpected result. But uh, in order to fix it, what we could do is uh, there are two basically different conventions to fix this issue. Uh, one, we could initialize a copy of a number within the range scope, which is sort of my preference of what I would go for, uh, which is commented out on line 12 there because I wanted to showcase the another uh, convention, uh, which is the we can pass in um, the number as a argument to, to the function uh, of the part go routine. Um, so whenever we do this, you would that would basically fix the issue, uh, and you would see probably uh, the numbers being printed 
uh, then. Uh, another one that uh, I got is defer execution order. Um, so when you initialize a defer, uh, it basically goes into sort of like a stack. And the more we add to the defer stack, it gets appended to the end, right? And uh, when the defer, defer stack gets finally executed uh, and it runs in the order of what was last initialized. Um, so if we take this example, we basically have a function stack. Uh, we have a fir first defer function and then the second one, which gets added to the stack. But whenever the stack gets executed, function two runs first then function one runs uh, after. So this is like something that she, it's good to, to keep in mind whenever you use defer functions. Um, so whenever we try to run this code, basically runs in reverse order. Um, and then another thing uh, that really got me is interfaces so really is uh, go is really different to where it comes to implementing interfaces uh, so interfaces in, in go are implicit um, th this means that basically whenever a type does not have to declare if they are implementing a, a specific internet interface or not basically a type either implements all the the methods of an interface and by doing that it uh, it implements the interface itself. Um, so if we take a look at this example, we've got animal interface with uh, sound methods, and then we've got two structs, cat and a dog, and both of them have the sound methods. And by implementing the sound method, they automatically implicitly implement the animal interface which is something that I had to get really used to as it's a unique way of doing, doing things. Um, but uh, I really think it's really powerful and I came to love it actually. Uh, and then another one is maps. Um, so with, with <coughs> iterating over maps uh, is that it's, you know, it's, totally unpredictable and variable. So for example, in this example, we have a simple map where we go in JavaScript and we just simply range, range over it. Um, but we could run this code a thousand times <laughs> and it will, could print Go, but the next time we run it, it could simply just print JavaScript. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind when you're uh, using maps as uh, it definitely caught me a lot of times when learning Go. Um, um, but yeah, that's what I've got for you today. Um, gonna gonna leave you with this quote from Yada. Uh, <laughs> pass on what you have learned. Um, uh, we try to do this in our team when we share our knowledge and it's really useful whenever somebody learns something or, or something. So it's really cool. If you can do the same in your team, I would really recommend it. Um, there are a few books that I would recommend. Uh, the first one, the uh, Ultimate Go Notebook, it's it's basically a notebook of everything about Go. And uh, I quite often go back to it whenever I need to refresh my mind about something. Um, and then 100 Go mistakes. I haven't finished that one yet, but uh it's it has really cool stuff in there as well if you're learning uh, if you're thinking of learning of go then it's really good stuff um but yeah that's me thanks for listening and i hope you enjoyed it